Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening at our Histories Online series. For year 2021, we are placing the focus on biodiversity and the environment to tie up with an exciting exhibition titled Human and Nature that we are launching next month. This evening's topic is the 8% solution, biodiversity, imperialism, and nature in Singapore. We are happy to have with us Professor Timothy Bernard. Professor Bernard is with the Department of History at the National University of Singapore, where he focuses on the environmental and cultural history of the Straits of Malacca. I will now pass on the session to him. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I would like to thank everyone who has uh, taken time out of their day to come here to listen to this talk. So hopefully it'll be interesting and we can uh, spur discussion and have questions and such. And I would just like to uh, begin by saying that when I was first approached about speaking uh, in this series, it was part as part of the National Library's uh, exhibition that will be coming up on humans and nature. And as part of the exhibition, they were showing me some of the things that will be on display, various documents and things. And, and so I thought I would use that as kind of the core or the basis of the talk today. But before we get uh, to talking about the biodiversity and nature and such in our past here in Singapore, I think we have to talk about Singapore that we know today. And as I was working up this PowerPoint presentation as part of this talk, it was amazing how every day I needed to add something new in there because of events that have been occurring over the last week or two. Uh, essentially, we live in what is often termed a green city. And Singapore is quite a green city. It, it is quite remarkably covered in vegetation. Uh, recently, I mean, uh, here we have a couple of uh, photographs of the National Library and everyone uh, is familiar with that, I hope. And you can even see there's trees around it. But recently we've, uh, in the news, there have been two stories uh, that have caught the attention of uh, many people in Singapore. And one was the potential uh, destruction of the Dover Forest, which is a, a small strip of forest uh, near uh, Holland Village and such. And it, it amounts to about 33 hectares of forest land. The other one, which just came in the news over the last 24 to 48 hours, was a portion of the Kranji Woodlands, which amounts to about 70 hectares, was mistakenly uh, destroyed by the uh, Jurong Town Corporation. And those people have been reprimanded, apparently, or something along those lines. But within this, this raises issues about our forest cover. It raises issues about how much forest cover Singapore has had in the past and how this was handled or dealt with by the government. Because this has been an issue, how land, how forests have been utilized in Singapore for the entire past 200 years, the colonial era. Now, if we think of Singapore, uh, what it was like in a you know, untouched state, this is a, a map that appears in a chapter by a man named Antonio Dempsey in a book titled Nature Contained. And it's a depiction of what Singapore most likely looked like prior to uh, human change that was induced upon it. And so you have a mixture of mangrove forests, diptero carp forests and things like that. But essentially we can say Singapore was forested almost over its entirety. Now, Despite there being 700 years of Singaporean history, as we like to talk about and such, uh, the real change that occurred uh, and the amount of change that occurred began approximately 200 years ago when the East India Company arrived. And here on the left, I have a quote from uh, Raffles in which he said, after drawing together all the wild animals of the forest and collected the rich plants of the mountains, I am now endeavoring to tame the one and cultivate the other and have undertaken the arduous task of converting a wilderness into a garden. Now, a garden is a place in which the plants are chosen, it is managed, it is controlled. 
by humans. Now, this leads us to think about what, were, what was the goal of the East End Company? Why, why were they in Singapore? We often hear, well, it was a trade port. It was a, a stopover for the trade between India and China. It provided them a base for uh, activities in Southeast Asia. But at its core, it, of course, was a trading company. So what was the goal of this East India Company? It was trade and natural products, agriculture. If we think about it, even why Singapore was halfway between India and China, it was about the idea of uh, the trade in tea and in opium to natural products. And so the thing is, with the development of agriculture, this is also what the goals were for the island of Singapore. I'm, we need to look beyond the port. And so imperialism was used to shape the landscape of Singapore. And so the thing is, if they were going to transform this island biologically, it would be to fit the needs of the political, economic, and social forces of imperialism. Now, Singapore is a, is a place that's relatively easy to study this because of the continuous imperial records here, or you know, the, the existence of imperial records but also its size and the idea that we can develop the, uh, uh, you know, it's a small enough area where we can see the effects of such policies and such rule. Now, what ultimately happened, and I'll run through this uh, relatively quickly, was the spread of plantation agriculture. Within decades, uh, the new humans that were living here, whether they're British or Chinese, spread out into the Singaporean uh, landscape and began converting the land for agriculture. Initially, they started with nutmeg. Nutmeg ended up uh, not working out due to a disease, but the main crop being planted in Singapore was pepper and gambier. And what eventually developed is that Chinese residents of Singapore would gather in the Ulu areas and the farm areas around uh, groupings, which came to be known as the Kangchu system. And we still have the heritage of that today in Chukangs in various HB, HDB towns, such as Chua Chukang or Lim Chukang. These were originally pepper and gambier plantation centers. And what Tony O'Dempsey has shown in his paper is that for every hectare of pepper and gambier that was uh, actually planted, they needed another hectare to just process it, to boil uh, the gambier leaves, to dry out the pepper and such so that it could be exported. Ultimately, due to its 15 year life cycle, pepper and gambier spread very quickly throughout Singapore and over about two or three generations of this life cycle, much of the island had been converted to agriculture. And by the mid 19th century, over a third of the island after the uh, plantations had been abandoned had converted into lalang, uh, which we all know is a kind of a nasty grass and such. Now you can see to, on, the, on the right side of the screen, that's a map of Singapore from 1862. And uh, of interest, or I find with differences in Singapore today, of course, is you don't see the water, uh, the water catchment areas, McRitchie Reservoir, Upper and Lower Pierce and such, but they're moving out into these areas and it's being devastated biologically, okay? Now, this led to some concern from the government. And so the government commissioned two reports to be written. Uh, the first in 1879, the second in 1882. The first of those reports was written by uh, McNair, J.F.A. McNair, who is, was a colonial engineer, but he was in charge of many different aspects of uh, in, within the colonial system in the 19th century. He had been in charge of the prisons. He had done a variety of things. In a sense, he was a civil servant technocrat. And he wrote a, a report in 1879. You can see it on the right side of the screen here. And the second person asked to write a report was Nathaniel Cantley, who was the superintendent of the Singapore Botanic Gardens between 1880 and 1888. And Cantley came in and wrote a report from a botanist's 
point of view about what had happened in Singapore. So let's let's go over what was in these two reports because they give us a picture of what the Singaporean landscape looked like some 140, 150 years ago. Basically, McNair as a technocrat was writing about what the type of timber resources there were. You know, in other words, what the species of trees were, their potential for profit once they were harvested. And one of the key points in his report was that the amount of forest cover was diminishing. And he said that was due to from the sale of land and extension of cultivation and too often from illicit felling and from charcoal burning. In other words, they were using it for agriculture and they were also using it for cooking and other purposes you may use uh, timber for. Uh, concern was, he, uh, McNair expressed a concern also that deforestation was beginning to affect the climate. There, there was, uh, in the 19th century, as imperialism was spreading and the various aspects of imperialism were spreading, there were attempts to uh, understand the weather here a bit better. And Fiona Williamson at SMU is working on that and doing a very good job of giving us an understanding of the meteorology and, and the science of that and what, what they were discovering at the time. But ultimately they believe there was a, there was a decline in the amount of rainfall in Singapore and there was a belief that this, a lot of this was uh, affected by the amount of deforestation that was occurring. Ultimately in the report, McNair uh, estimated that Singapore had about 22,000 acres of remaining forest. That would mean within, realize that within 60 years, 85% of Singapore had been deforested, okay? Now, in 1882, Nathaniel Thantley uh, submitted his report, and he was in, with, at least within Victorian manners and moral, uh, you know, morals, he was extremely upset, and he could not believe the amount of econo uh, ecological devastation that had occurred in Singapore. And in his report, he wrote that it was apparent that no sufficient attempts had been made to conserve the government forest lands and that it was hard to conceive of a more short-sighted policy than that which had suffered these settlements to drift into the present condition of scarcity of forest and forest produce. Now, the report, uh, Cantley's report, you can see on the right side of the screen, that's the first page of it. It was many, many pages in which he documented how bad things were in Singapore. His estimate was even uh, more stark than uh, McNair's had been, and he estimated that there were only 5,000 acres left in Singapore. That's a bit over 2,000 hectares. Ultimately, that would have been about 4% of the land in uh, the 1880s in Singapore before we did all our rant, land reclamation. Now, let's put this in a bit of a context. I mentioned Dover earlier. I mentioned the Cranji uh, Woodlands. In the report, Cantley mentioned that the forests that remain are widely distributed in patches or clumps from a half an acre or so to about 25 acres and of no particular shape. In other words, they were scattered throughout the island. There was no connection between them. It was a devastated ecological landscape. Um, when he says the largest forest patch was 25 acres, realize that is only 10 hectares, which is one fourth the size of the Dover forest that we are concerned about today. Essentially, by the 1880s, Singapore was facing an environmental crisis. The entire island had been deforested. It had led to problems with the water table and uh, it had led to problems with the availability of timber, which would be needed for construction or for cooking. And there was a serious problem. And this leads us to the larger context of what we're really talking about, which is nature and imperial power. Essentially what had happened was the British government had come in and had shaped this land to meet their needs. And this continues today, okay? 
Now, what was the result of all of this deforestation that Cantley was writing about and McNair and others? Ultimately, it was reduced biodiversity. Agriculture is simply the simplification of the landscape. You take a very diverse, let's just argue one hectare of land, which may have birds and animals and insects and uh, who knows what within it and plant life. And you remove all of that and simply plant one or two products, for example, pepper and gambier. You simplify the landscape. And so this deforestation process was a massive simplification and reduction in biodiversity in Singapore. Uh, some scientists at NUS uh, you know, in the current era have called this period one in which Singapore was devastated biologically. And Cantley even mentioned this in his report on page 10 when he wrote the forests of this colony are singularly devoid of animal life. So when we look at this uh, illustration to the right, it's uh, one from 1879, so exactly in the era I'm talking about, by a man named John Edmund Taylor, who came here and did some watercolors and such. What you have is a picture of a hunter going out, uh, assisted by a dog and a, uh, and a coolie or a person to help him with the hunt. But the thing I wanna point out is, look at the background. While you have some bushes, short trees in the foreground. In the background, it shows devastated trees. It shows a devastated landscape. And so what it comes down to is that the natural environment in Singapore could no longer support the imperial presence, the expanding human presence. Some of this is due to population pressure. In 1830, for example, Singapore only had around 16, 17,000 people. By 1880, it was 137,000 people. Now, with, uh, with the deforestation and the population rise, what it meant was there was going to be uh, a strain on water resources, for example, the use of wells to gain your water. Now, they had already begun the creation of what was to become McRitchie Reservoir, but you also didn't have timber. You had nothing you could cook. You couldn't cook. Uh, you couldn't create charcoal. You couldn't, you know, in other words, there were serious problems related to water and timber, and this island could no longer support its population. So, Cantley comes up with a solution, sends it up to the government in this 1882 report, and basically it was to create a forest department. Now, what the solution was, was that agriculture would, would no longer take place for the most part in Singapore. Uh, while we would have rubber plantations and other things, we needed to reestablish the forests. Agriculture could shift to the Malay Peninsula. Now realize this is also occurring as the British are moving into the Malay Peninsula and colonizing that era, uh, area. Um, whether we call it federated Malay states, unfederated, it was a movement of this system. Uh, even in Johor, the uh, Timungong, or ultimately the Raja and the uh, Sultan, same person, uh, was uh, agreeing for people to go over to Johor and continue with the same type of plantation agriculture, which would transform that landscape. That's uh, covered in a book by Carl Trotke called Prince of Pirates. But basically, agriculture, large scale, devastating agriculture wouldn't take place in Singapore for the most part and shift to the Malay Peninsula. There would then be a concerted attempt to reestablish, to reforest Singapore to secure these resources of water and timber. To do so, Cantley established a forest department and forest reserves. And th these forest reserves would be under the remit or under the control of the Singapore Botanic Gardens. So Cantley began a massive program of replanting areas, trying to connect up these isolated patches, trying to save particular areas. Uh, Cantley died in 1888. He apparently had been sickly much of the time he was here anyway. 
and he went to Australia to uh, recover from an illness. And while he was in Tasmania, he passed away. His replacement was the well-known uh, botanist uh, Henry Ridley. And Ridley came here in 1889 and simply continued the programs to reforest Singapore. Now, what was the result of all this? What would, by the 1890s, this was considered to be a tremendous success. We have turned back the tide of econo uh, ecological catastrophe. We have saved our island. And Ridley was proclaiming this by 1890 in the first forest report he wrote, because the amount of forest cover had doubled from 4% to 8%. We had found the solution to dealing with, we learned our lesson, if you will, we found our solution to the problem of deforestation and uh, how it had made the island uninhabitable, or it was pushing it toward being uninhabitable. This was a huge success. Ridley would crow about this. You know, we're, we're doing a great job here. And this, the amount of forest cover reached 11% by 1900. Now, the map here on the right side is a representation of that 11%. That comes from a report that a man named H.C. Hill wrote who came in to assess how the forests were doing and essentially take them out of Ridley's control in 1890. And what hits me when I look at that map is once again, we're missing lower piers and upper piers and such, but also think of how limited that amount of force cover they are showing on this map is. And th this is a success. This is the solution to the problem. Now, some of these areas today continue to be what we would consider to be forest reserve or forest, forested areas in Singapore. Um, but some of them we have even lost, such as the Ulu Pandan Forest Reserve, which was converted in, uh, for industrial production uh, in the 1860, uh, 1960s and 1970s. But ultimately, the government had turned back the tide, had solved the problem, or is the way they like to present it, and they had secured Singapore's uh, ecological uh, sustenance through through creating water reserve uh, reservoirs bringing water and they were going to reestablish timber which could provide for uh cooking and other matters now i'm going to go through a very quick century of forestry here in singapore because the main point i wanted to go across was this idea of these two documents and the fact that singapore had faced an economic crisis due to deforestation some 140, 150 years ago. A, basically what happened was forestry was taken out of the hands of the Singapore Botanic Gardens in 1904. Ridley was a very difficult individual for anyone to get along with. He was uh, perceived as being very arrogant. He didn't work with others well. Um, he, while he fulfilled his KPIs in a modern Singaporean sense, he, he ruffled everyone's feathers in the process. So when Hill came in 1900 to write that report, the goal of that was to take the forestry department out of Ridley's hands. And this was done in 1904 when the forestry department was transferred to Kuala Lumpur or on the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur. And this partly has to do with what the goals of a forestry department are, because those goals are growing Trees, yes, okay, uh, cultivating a forest, but usually cultivating that forest so that the timber is useful, that it can be harvested, it can be used for construction, it can be used for other needs. And the thing is, they realized Singapore was not large enough to sustain a timber industry. And so the idea of utilizing timber was quickly abandoned. Some of that was due to the fact that the type of timber they wanted to grow were tropical hardwoods. Think of things like teak. The problem was when you had so much of the island covered in Lalong, it was difficult for these tropical hardwoods to establish themselves, first of all. And then secondly, 
uh, they take a long time to grow. And people didn't have the time or the patience to wait for these uh, trees to go through their normal cycle before they would become economically uh, valuable. And so they abandoned the idea of using the timber resources for profit. So what that meant was, let's create our forest reserves and our forested areas to preserve or to secure our water resources. Ultimately, McRitchie, Upper and Lower Piers, and the other reservoirs that would follow. And out of this, the idea of the transfer to KL of the forestry department and abandoning Singapore in that regard about timber resources, the central catchment area develops. Now, this was an area in which almost the entirety of it had been devastated. There was no really remaining uh, forest. Uh, and so to protect that vulnerable area, it was to be used for basically preserving the water, uh, water resources. Other areas could be converted into agriculture, whether it be rubber production, pineapple, and ultimately food production. But, and this continued up to the 1980s. Singapore was food secure. The landscape, this land that had been devastated actually did produce food from the 1930s up to the 1980s. And, and up to the 1980s, we were almost uh, self-sufficient in many different foods, such as eggs and pork and uh, chicken and, and uh, leafy vegetables. We produced a high percentage of them. The government decided that was not a good use of our land. And so in the uh, 1980s, the primary production department shut that down and transferred or began to utilize the land, land for housing and industrial expansion. Some of this also has to do with, as the population grew in the 1980s, around 2 million people plus, uh, it was getting to a point where the agriculture couldn't support uh, feeding the population. And so they decided to make decisions that were pragmatic in promoting uh, economic development and industrial production. But as part of this process, even some of the forest reserves came under stress. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, as I mentioned earlier, Ulu Pandan became, um, you know, industrial areas. Uh, if you look at the map to the right, which is a modern vegetation map of Singapore, uh, the area that would be the Ulu Pandan area would, is basically black <laughs> on that area or non-vegetated. Uh, the Bukit Brown case is a more recent one that really create a lot of uh, emotional and emotive responses from the population. Uh, and that has basically been uh, classified as an area for HDB, uh, an HDB town to develop we had, and, uh, and a highway to go through. But this is also part of how our forested area and our understanding of what the forests are useful for and what a garden city is. The garden city program began in the 1960s to promote urban horticulture in the sense of planting trees and shrubs and just, you know, on the side of the road. And that really can't be classified as forest, although it is vegetation. But it is also part of a, a concept, a, a perspective on our landscape, on our forest, that we have managed and controlled forest cover, okay? And this is not only in the developed areas, it goes into even the nature reserves. This control and management extends out to the forest and ultimately it is at the mercy of how the, those in power see uh, the use of these forests for various activities and what we have. Now with that, that's a bit of a double, uh, you know, planting, but also then using it for what you want, creates a bit of a, a split personality in this. But today we do have a Singapore in which it is extremely green. We have a tremendous amount of forest cover. And uh, so you can read many different number there you know if you read reports there's different numbers about how much forest cover there is uh, one report says 56% of singapore is covered in vegetation another said 47% there is an international site that discusses urban greening and says that urban singapore 
covered in 29.3%. So that wouldn't include the catchment areas, for example, uh, and such. But the point is, no matter what number you use and what criteria you use, what they're really saying is that we have a very green city. I mean, even in all these reports, even in the one where it's 29%, we are the greenest city in the world. And so uh, it's not the number and the actual data point I'm uh, concerned with here, but it's just the very idea that we do live in what is depicted as a very green city, as a, as a garden city. And so wh where does that leave us, okay? Um, basically, if we go through all of this, we have to realize that our forests are relatively young here in Singapore. Uh, Richard Corlett, who used to be at NUS and is a biologist, in 1991 estimated that 99% of the original forest in Singapore had been cleared, okay? So the forest that we have, even in the central catchment area, should be considered new, recent, relatively young, man-made, use your, your favorite phrase in this regard. And the thing is, the forests of Singapore, if 99% of the original forest has been removed, the forests of Singapore represent a program of replanting that has occurred in the modern era under the PAP government, but occurred under the colonial government, it, is, it has occurred across literally centuries. We're in the third century of this. And so the existence of our forests here and the shape of them, the size of them is dependent on a number of factors. Uh, most of them being economic and political factors, deciding what to cut down and the reasoning behind it. Much of it in the early days, the reforestation programs, the 8% solution, were based on the need to secure a water supply. In the 21st century, we have different concerns. Uh, we often talk about biodiversity. And in Singapore, we have, for example, a uh, pangolin, you know, whenever there's a sighting of a pangolin, you'll, you'll see it on various news sites or social media feeds. And the otters, have become almost uh, animal celebrities in Singapore uh, with people taking photographs of them and, and various other things. And, and they're, they're held up as examples of, oh, see how diverse we are. Compared to what it was 200 years of ago, of course, we are much less biodiverse. What we are developing is an area in which the needs of an urban community of approximately 6 million people living here and uh, the needs of the economy are trying to be balanced out. I'm not, I'm not defending in any way. The, I, I don't think Kranji Woodland should have been cut down. I think Dover Forest should be left alone. But we have to realize that this occurs within different historical eras. And this is nothing new. Before I started this uh, uh, talk, I was chatting with the, the ladies on the panel and the ones who had set this up and our hosts, and we were discussing the recent uh, deforestation issues in the news. And I just kept saying, this is not new. Um, this is not surprising. And it's something we've been dealing with for 150 years. And it really comes down to how different governments have uh, dealt with our landscape, dealt with biodiversity, and handled the environment. Now, I'm coming toward the end of my talk here, but I just want to mention, I, you know, look, if you go to the library, and you should go to the library, and it's a great place, check out some books. I have three books that deal with uh, issues that I've touched upon here, and if you want to purchase the books, you can get them for 20% off if you use the code Barnard20 when you contact NUS Press.